hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Pace with retired New York City firefighter and Vietnam vet Billy O'Connor. We're on the air, you stupid mook. I mean, you mick. We're on the air. You stupid. We're asking for water. You're asking for all sorts of stuff. We're on the air. Well, I'm the stupid mick. You're the stupid mook. I'm just trying to get the dry patches off my mouth. And, and you guys then, tell me I always look like a mouth in the mouth. Yeah, you do. Uh, and and there's. The, <laughs> Derek Harris is joining us, the third man in the booth. Uh, nice to have you, Derek, again. Lovely, fellas. Good to Wait, see you guys both. You look so young. To, you guys look so young and vibrant. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to give him a pejorative nickname. we got to come up with a nickname for him. If you're going to be the Mook and I'm going to be the Mick, he's the, the mic. mic is already there, we're going to have to. He's the, the he's Mark. The, let let, let yes. him be the Yes. I don't want to keep I don't want to confuse. Well, way, also, uh, also for we don't want racists giving me names. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's for sure. That's for sure. So Billy's out. <laughs> I'm recovering. I'm recovering. Tell Jenny we're doing the show to stop talking to you. Yes, Jenny, we're doing a show. Stop talking to us. We can hear you. Okay. We we got we. Oh, you let me know when you're starting. And I'll shut up. All right, we're shut gonna up. we're gonna. Hey, I came up with a little something for you, Derek. You got a picture we can put up for us? Oh, the weather outside is frightful. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> There's no place to go. No place let to go. It snow, let it snow. Let it snow. Where the fuck do you live in California? It's amazing, right? I'm an hour and a half from you, and I got two feet of snow outside my door right now. Two feet. And more coming. But, more coming. But how much do you like snow? I hate snow. <laughs> I, 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 I hate it. And my wife, my wife thinks it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened. She goes, oh, look, it's a winter wonderland. It's beautiful out there. Look how gorgeous. Meanwhile, I mean, I'm from New York. And, and you know, being a firefighter, the cold is the worst thing you can, you can imagine. I mean, plus we get a lot more work. But we were on a job. During the winter, we get a lot more work, a lot more fires, because uh, we, we worked in poor neighborhoods, and, you know, they use space heaters. And space heaters are, are prone to tip over and cause a fire. So we used to have a lot of work, and when it's cold, and basically firemen are glorified laborers. I mean, let's face it, that's what we are. You're lugging the hose, you're forcing balls, yeah, well, and, the, and the hose organized gets all labor. frozen up. Organized labor. organized labor with a lot of guts. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's moments we have our moments, but it's like being a cop, you know, man. I mean, if you if you're a cop, and then you see these cop shows, and they're pulling their guns and they're shooting it out every twenty minutes, well, they're not going to show you a guy sitting in a car for eight hours drinking coffee and eating donuts, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's the same thing with firefighter shows. I mean, when I look at shows about firefighters, if the job was like that, there'd be nobody on it. I mean, especially with the backdraft. That movie was. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you know, guys running through burning buildings with their coat open, swinging an axe with no mask on. I mean, you know, I mean, 99% of the job is routine. But it's the 1% that you get paid for, you know. Or that's the, the 1% when you think you're going to die. You know? Wait a second, Billy. You were on how many calls a year? Oh, back in the day, in the 70s, we were doing uh, 14,000 runs a year. 14,000 wow. runs a year. 365 days, how can it be 99% nothing? Well, yeah, I might have exaggerated. Not, 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 but you know what? We look at things. Like, we, well, you know what? When you're doing that much work and you pull up to a vacant, say it's a vacant, which we had a lot of because the South Bronx was burning at the time and we had a ton of vacants. It looked like almost like Dresden after the fire bombings. And if you pull up to a vacant, it could be fire could be blowing out 40 windows. And we think that's routine because we're not going in. We're just going to put up a bucket and knock the hell out of it. Uh, somebody might go in on a floor below the fire uh, thinking it might be squatters, you know, or crack addicts or something that we got to grab and get them out of there. But other than that, that's too much is routine. Car fires, they're routine. That's not even a – we don't even look at that like a job. And another thing, 
every car fire I ever saw on television blows up. They always <laughs> blow up. Always. I have never been. I have been to 500 car fires. I have never seen one blow up, ever, ever. No matter how bad it burns. It burns, it melts. But we got to force the trunk. After we put the fire out, which takes five minutes, you know, we just we just knock it down. Then we got to pop the trunk because in the neighborhood we were in, a lot of that stand bodies exactly. They're always looking for a murder. There could be a murder involved in it, and uh, that's why they set fire to the car. Wow, wow! But uh, hey. I tell you a funny story. A funny story. When I was uh, before you tell me that funny story, our guest today is Hillary Bailey Smith. She's yeah. a uh, Emmy Emmy. Uh, soap opera star, actress, producer. She's a lot of fun. She's one of the women I always wanted, but I was afraid I could never catch him. So, uh, <laughs> and if you did catch him, what I happens then? I what to do with her anyway. <laughs> so, uh, you're going to be joining us a little while, but now your funny story. Well, I was obviously I worked in the South Bronx, right? So, uh, there was a lot of chop shops around the South Bronx, you know, where they'd steal cars. And, uh, and do what they had to do for parts, you know? So I had this old Cadillac. I mean, we were, everybody had a ghetto car. And uh, I had this old 75 Cadillac, a real- right. What do you, what, what did you find? Here we go, Derek. What do you define as a ghetto car? Well, a, a car that's an old bomb of a car that if it gets broken into, that nobody's gonna wanna steal because you well, couldn't bring a good car down to South Ross because they would get stolen a lot, you know? Well, well, they break into them you- for, for drugs, you know, money. So I had this old ghetto car, right? Cadillac. I think I paid a thousand bucks for it. This right? is when it I started big- start posturing uh, when you started using <laughs> <the> ghetto. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 it's a Cadillac. But why couldn't it be a Sopranos car? Why has it got to be a ghetto well, car? Well, actually, in, in our day, we used to call it a Jew canoe. You know? <laughs> 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 it was a real long caddy, you know? So uh, anyway, uh, I was out. I only had to think about two weeks. And I had paid a grand for it. So it was a real bomb. But I got loaded one night. I mean loaded. And I was driving a Cadillac home. And I hit a wall. I mean, that's how drunk I was. I hit a wall and I totaled this thing. I mean, I destroyed it. So I said, okay, man, I can't afford to buy another car right now. So I got to do an insurance job on this thing. You know, I got to claim insurance. So I, <laughs> I bring it down. To, I bring it down to the firehouse, and uh, I wait till about one o'clock in the morning, and I grab a radio, and I tell the guy in the house, "Watch, look, if we get a, if we get a run, call me right away. I'm gonna I'm gonna drive this car over to where the chop shops are, and let them do a number on it because I'm gonna claim an insurance job, right? So I drive it three blocks away, park it by the chop shops." And this is one o'clock in the morning. And I jog back to the firehouse, right? And I get back to the firehouse. I said, okay, that car will be decimated by tomorrow morning. No worries. Then I realized, I said, holy mackerel, man. I drove it over there and I didn't pull the ignition with a bam bam. So if What's the a cops bam-bam? find What's a bam bam is what they a bam bam is what they use to pull the ignitions out of cars when they steal them. You know, it's uh it's it's a, it's a tool that they screw it in and just pull it, pulls the whole ignition out. Then okay. they hot wire. Well, that's what they I, do. I, I don't want to interrupt the story, but I, I want to I want to understand whether or not you were. How do you know about these things? Were you like a car thief at one point? Up in the Bronx. No, because in the firehouse we had bam bams. I mean, we had we had oh, all those tools. Okay. Okay. We also wow. had we also have the you know the uh, slim jims that you got to break into cars for. You know, when you go down for the window with a Slim Jim because we had to get into the cars. But anyway, I digress. So now I get back to the firehouse and I said, oh, man, I forgot to pull the ignition. If the cops find the car, they're going to know that how did they get here? It had to be driven here. I said, I got to go back. So I tell the guy in the house, watch, I got to go back. I said, we get anything, call me right away. So now I'm jogging back. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. I get there at 1.15. And I'm worried about the ignition. Well, I'm telling you, the car was up on four milk crates. <laughs> there was no ignition. There was no ignition. There was no dashboard. There was no. There was no interior. All the all the seats were missing. I mean, there was totally Richard Petty's pit crew couldn't have did a job as fast on this right on, on this car. It was decimated. 
So I went back to the firehouse. I said, cool. Great. I'm good. <laughs> now, naturally, in the morning, I'm going to report to Class Stone. So I walk into the 4 row precinct, and, uh, and I says, hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm a fireman around the corner, you know. I says, uh, my Cadillac got stolen last night. Cop says, no problem. He says, fill out a, you know, it's a stolen car report, and uh, we'll get to you. So now as I'm filling out the report, I says, let me be clever here, you know. And I say, like, like, like I'm really concerned about the car, you know. And I look up at the cop at the, at the desk, and I says, hey, uh, by the way, I says, uh, what's the chances you're going to be able to find the car? And the cop starts laughing. He goes, hey, man. Hey, look at this fireman. This fireman wants to know what's the chances we're going to find this car. Can you believe this guy? He goes, I mean, the car was decimated in 15 minutes, man. Uh, they operate fast, boy, I tell you. Uh, just my, tripped. my friend Tony O'Dell is an actor. He was one of the stars of Head of the Class. And he had a pretty nice BMW. Uh, and he had his, uh, his uh, acting photos his headshots in the back of the car. So one day his car was stolen and they was decimated. The only thing, it was up on fours. It was, the seats were gone. Everything was gone except his head seats, his head photos. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was the worst thing that could have done to him as an actor would leave the headshots. <laughs> That's great. That's like the old joke about the guy who's the bagpiper, and he goes down to the Paddy's Day Parade, and he's walking towards the parade, and he says, oh, my God, I left my, I left my bagpipes in the car, and the window's down. So he ran back to his car, but it was too late. Somebody had thrown another set of bagpipes in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Billy, this week is Super Bowl week. We're, we're not, we'll save our picks, but what do you, what, what do you have to tell us about gambling during Super Bowl week? Uh, the biggest super spreader event of the year. It may be bigger than maybe bigger than Christmas holiday. For spreading the for spreading COVID, you mean? Yeah, because everybody's going to have everybody over their house to watch the game. People are unbelievable. People are unbelievable. But yeah, you're probably right. It probably will be. I got to tell you, nowadays, if you're a bookie. The Super Bowl, of course, is a windfall. Everybody bets the Super Bowl. I mean, FBI agents have boxes, you know, have pools. Uh, priests bet the Super Bowl. Everybody bets the Super Bowl. Everybody. It's a national holiday. But my day, now everything's offshore, so they don't have to worry about it. All the bookmaking outfits are offshore. It's all computerized. In my day, we took the action in the apartment. And Super Bowl Sunday was a scary day for bookmakers. Because that's the day that all the busts go down. And the reason the busts go down on Super Bowl Sunday is because let's say you're a cop. Let's say you're captain, captain of a precinct. And you're going to bust a bookmaking organization. Which nowadays is pretty much a slap on the wrist. You know, they give you what they call a KGB, which is a known gambler. And it's a smack on the wrist. I mean, God, Frank, we, we, we talked about this. They're advertising bookmaking sites on on television during the games. I mean, it's incredible to me yeah. because yeah. you know we were we were clandestine. We had to be underground. I, I was afraid, you know, of, of of getting busted. They would have took everything we had with the RICO Act. So uh, what we did was on Super Bowl Sunday. You know, we were so. What happens is, it's he's it's, it's a captain of a precinct, right? He says, "Okay, if I bust these bookmakers, let's say they took." $4,000 worth of action one day. Well, on Super Bowl Sunday, you're going to take $200,000 worth of action. You know, everybody bets the Super Bowl. And then you get a guy like you, say you're a $100 better, you're going to call in and you're going to bet $100 for you, and you're going to bet another 1000 for everybody that's around with you watching the game, that want action on the game. You might be betting both sides of the game. You know, give me 500 on uh, Dallas. I give you another 700 on the Giants because you're just accommodating your guests so everybody bet. So now, if you get busted on Super Bowl Sunday, they, they come in and they say, oh, let's for the action, times that by 365, and we just busted a $30 million a year operation. <laughs> like, because it makes 
Yeah, that's what they do. It makes great headlines. Exactly. It makes everybody know that the, the precinct is doing their best to keep the community safe from these blaggards, you know, that are taking action. And so it, it was a nightmare. I mean, they're always afraid of getting busted on Super Sunday because some of our friends that were in the racket, they tell us over the years that that's when they got busted on Super Sunday. So what we did was one year, we took the apartment and Blinky, my partner Blinky, was always ahead of the curve. He said, here's what we'll do. We'll put three phones. We'll put our regular three phones in this apartment. We'll rent the apartment down the hall. So what, oh, did, yeah. what, did, so Blinky, what, did, what did Blinky do, Billy? Well, what he did was he put, we rented another apartment on the same floor as the apartment we were taking action in. And he put our regular three phones and call forwarded all three numbers to three phones that we were in the right apartment, into a new apartment with. And sure enough, that day, we were taking action at about one o'clock in the afternoon. We were taking action about an hour and we started hearing, bam, bam, bam. So my other partner, Red, ran to the peephole looking out the apartment number. And sure enough, the cops were breaking in the door. And I got to tell you, they broke in that door. And all they found was three empty phones. And, uh, <laughs> oh, man, the invectives. The, you could hear the cursing coming through the doors. And, of course, we shut off all our phones for an hour until they left. But he saved our ass that day, man. Uh, you know, I was talking before about the Bronx and the South Bronx. And this, you know, this is you keeping it short, right? Is he going on to another story? <laughs> yeah, it's a short story, though. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the neighborhood that we worked in, English was a second language, pretty much, for most of the inhabitants of the South Bronx. And uh, one time I pull up to this, two o'clock in the afternoon, we pull up to this guy is unconscious. We get a call. There's a guy unconscious. We pull up. There's got to be 40 people around him in a circle. So we break through the circle, and I'm lead man here for some reason. I'm going to take the initiative, and I feel his pulse, and I got to work on this guy, right? I got to give him mouth to mouth. So I'm about to get mouth to mouth and I have a thought crosses my head. I look up at the crowd and I say, hey, does anybody know this guy? One guy says, yeah, yeah, I know. I says, does he have HIV? No, because I got to put my mouth on this guy. I says, does he have HIV? He says, no, 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 definitely not HIV. I said, okay, cool. I'm just about to put my mouth out and the same guy yells out, I think he got Blue Cross. <laughs> 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 and wow. I out at that point I was about to say you ain't gonna make it <laughs> so Derek do you want to bring Hillary on uh yes I'm uh yes I'll bring Hillary on right now Let me uh, introduce our guest. Billy, you're going to love our guest. Our next guest is uh, an Emmy Award winning actress, but she's a real dame. I think I'm on. Hi. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Frank. You know, well, she, ain't, she ain't hard on the ice, Frank. I can tell you that. I like her already. She ain't hard on the ice. So why don't you bring on Hillary, Derek? She's up. There she is. How are you, Miss Hillary? Hi, Frank. I have missed you. It's been a long time. I've all, I still always pine for you. Well, I'm telling you, if these lips could talk, I thought it was a book about our love affair. I had no idea there would be other. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> That's Derek, a little kiss and tell him. I know. I love this. Look at Frank. He's blushing. I've never seen that before. <laughs> That's uh, the. That's Billy O'Connor, who I wrote the book with. 
And Hi, hello. And hello, Derek, Hillary. A pleasure to know you, girl. And nice Derek, to meet you. And Derek Harris is the guy in the lower right or lower left. Or I, I still don't know. The, I still don't know the, oh, my, there he is. Hi, Derek. Hi, how are you? Good. I've got two Franks and two Bills, and Derek popped in a little bit, but that was it. Yeah, so that's that's that's, that's the way this, that's the way this operates. Sometimes okay. five billies and one Frank. I'm just talking to you, and I'm looking at you, and I'm happy to see you. That's for sure. How you been? I've been well. I've been well. You know, it's um, uh, we've had a lot of togetherness, a lot of togetherness. But I think everybody has. It's a good thing. It's a bad thing. It's just a, it's a new way of life, and um, and I think we're doing all right. Well, I, Billy, I'll tell you that uh, Hillary is sort of like Margaret Dumont was with, uh, <laughs> with the Marx Brothers. <laughs> she, her husband's name is Nip. Her her son's name is Fip. She, her last name is Smith. Uh, and she <laughs> she plays comedy like nobody else. But she she she's very patrician in her approach, and she's won an an Emmy Award for soap operas. She's a producer now of the It Girl on the Stoop. An and Emmy Award winning producer. Oh, excuse me, because I never won. Wow. So you won one? I did. What about this? What'd you tell us about it? Well, it's a show called Venice, and, and uh, it started uh, with uh, two characters. It's actually interesting. They Procter & Gamble did a story on Guiding Light about um, a woman who gets a heart transplant and from a man and then ultimately felt, feels very drawn to his wife but Procter and Gamble would, <laughs> right it's a soap opera but Procter and Gamble would never let them you know touch or kiss or anything like that and there were it was a built up of a huge fan base around the world and uh the two actresses um we we took the two actresses and um did a show called Venice the series you know, different characters, but the same actresses. Um, Crystal Chappelle was one of them, and she produced this show called Venice, the series. And um, it took off. We're, we've done seven seasons, and um, we've been nominated for Emmys. I think it's won twice, three times. But wow. I only once for producing, so. Oh, excuse me. Only, only once for producing. Only once. Only one Emmy. <laughs> That's terrific. Thank you. So you. So you. Go ahead, Billy. Go ahead, Frank. I'm sorry. No, you got it. Well, I was going to ask you, like, uh, your me you is basically, I mean, soap operas. You've done every major soap opera imaginable, I mean, for, for a number of years. Uh, and you're an old pro. I mean, I don't mean old in a derogatory way, but you're a pro. Uh, do you ever get nervous when you switch me yous? you know, when you go into a movie or something else, when you get out of your, you know, well, I did everything backwards. I, I started on Broadway and then I went and did regional theater at the Guthrie. And I started in, and then I did prime time before I did daytime. And I did a movie before I did a, you know, had a hit series. You know, it just, everything went kind of backwards. And I think it basically boils down. Yeah, there, all the mediums have a different energy and a different uh, level that you bring to it. Um, but I, I think the only thing that I can say that was consistent for me was just bringing a joy of life to to each medium, and um, and that, that seemed to translate for me. That's that was the common denominator in, in in everything. Just a just a joy of life. But yeah, Broadway is different. You're playing to the second balcony, whereas in um, you know a film, you're you know it's all right here. Uh, so you're 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 playing to someone who's sitting right there and 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 sitcoms are tough because not only do you have an audience but you also have the cameras so you have to find that happy medium which i think we did on something wilder that was so much fun we'll talk about something wilder in a little bit but didn't you find that uh, soap operas were difficult were more, the most difficult acting because you had to digest 35 pages of dialogue a day and every day would be a new day when I was doing, um, when I first got on something uh, on One Life to Live, um, I played a lawyer and there was a big trial. It was a rape trial. Um, and I had 60 to 80 pages of dialogue every single night. And you have to learn it because it's all trial work. So there's no conversation 
not when you're the one driving every question. So yeah, it was a lot. It's a memory is a muscle, you know, use it or lose it. And that's what you just do. I mean, you, you found a routine. Everyone has a different routine to memorize lines. And my routine would be to break down the arcs and, and digest the conversations and then, you know, be able to regurgitate them. But you got to have your lines down because there's so much else being thrown at you and you really only have one take. They'll let you have two takes, but a light better fall on the set if you go to a third take. You, you know, you got you to gotta get it. Judge, judge now. <laughs> Jed Nelson used to say when we gave him a line change, so much, so much for subtext. Trying to get the words in the right order. That's now right. you're memorizing, you're memorizing eighty pages of dialogue, and it yeah. has to be precise. It has to be word for word, or does it occasionally? It really, it really does, because the directors. Now remember, you're not the only one that's you know doing everything immediately. The directors, the camera. Everyone, it's, it's like doing, shooting a play live, only, you, you know, you have a safety net because you can go back, but the directors are cutting and they, they count on you saying those words so they know where to take that cut. And the cameramen count on you saying those words so they know when they can move the camera in between cuts. They yeah. have shot cards that they follow. Don so, Scarpino told us that if you wanted to kill a take, you had a curse. Yes, pretty much. Like I said, if a light fell on the set, maybe they'd say cut. But other than that, they didn't have the time. You've got to keep going. So wow. you you were on, you were NORA on One Life to Live for 20 years, weren't you? 22 years, yeah. I was only going to do it for like five. I was just, you know, I was just going to do it for five years just to be home with the kids because I was constantly traveling. And I really, I really loved the character. I got to create her. I really loved my castmates, Bobby Woods, Cassie DePriva, Catherine Hick. I mean, it was just really fun. And then that was the one thing. We were a family, dysfunctional family, but a family nonetheless. And we just had a ball. We really, you're in the trenches every day with people. And I love my cast. I love my crew. Uh, you know, the staff was great. The writers were great. It was really a special time. You're spending as much time with this cast, I mean, over a number of years, than you are with your family. I mean, they become family, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, we still keep in touch, and we're all, um, you know, we all care about each other and worry about each other. I have to say that after 22 years, I realized that I spent more time being Nora than I did being Hillary. And uh, it was quite a change uh, when Nora was kind of out of my life to sort of regroup and go, okay. Maybe I need to figure out who I am and uh, on a consistent basis. Well, soap fans are very, very loyal, don't you think? Yes, very. Very loyal. I still, I mean, I have um, people that I keep in touch with to this day. And that's why Venice, the series, was such a success because the fans from Guiding Light uh, came over and uh, to Venice and watched it and then word spread and then also the LBGT community, you know, that was, that was huge. That, that was worldwide that came on board and, uh, and created this, um, you know, very positive uh, group of, of fans, very supportive of each other in chat rooms, um, really a loving group of people. And I, I to this day, I, I could call a fan and say, I need help. And they would drop everything and go because you're in their house for an hour every day. And also soap actors are very um, aware um, of their fans and very aware of the blessings of viewers. And so we're really good to the people that watch us um, in person and appreciative of them and they're appreciative of us. So it's, it's really um, a very, lovely uh relationship so in, in the 22 years uh who are some of the young actors that you helped groom to start <laughs> well i don't know whether i helped groom them but i mean i came on with um uh uh gosh she played betsy what's her name um oh come on she was married to um senior moment senior moment 
senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more, more. Derek, you got this to look forward to. Yes, I, another one. I'm putting <laughs> it down on my list. Tomei had just come out of uh, BU when she came on uh, as the world turns. So I worked with her. And um, who was that? Julianne Moore. Marissa yeah. Tomei, Julianne wow. Moore. Um, uh, Finn Carter, uh, Lindsay, um, girl played, Lin and I'm getting characters and stuff, but I'm missing the big one, which is, um, Meg Ryan. Oh, Meg Ryan. Yeah. Oh, Meg Ryan too, huh? Hey, Derek. Yeah, but I heard, I heard George Clooney got started in, uh, Stop Opera. Did you think it's because, Everybody did. as you mentioned, Jimmy Jones was on One Life to Live. Ryan. Really? Oh, yes. I mean, you, it's very interesting. A lot of people got their starts on one like on, uh, on on soap operas. It was a it was a great gig. You could do your do you, at night and your soaps during the day. Do you think it's because, as you mentioned before, that even with Broadway and movies, that you really had to stretch yourself more with uh, soaps that that just stretches their talent and makes them better, and that's why so many have come out of there. Um, I think that if you were successful on a soap, you could pretty much be successful anywhere because it really just, you know, I don't, I don't know many stupid soap people. They're, they're very smart. They understood all aspects of the medium. And, um, uh, it, it, yeah, I think that if you were successful on a soap opera, you could really be successful anywhere in the business. And also, Hill, uh, do you think, or I, uh, do you think that because you're on television every day, you're getting exposure, uh, daily exposure to a lot of casting directors, and they, uh, especially in the '80s and '90s, uh, you could be discovered on soaps. No, I, I, I would disagree with that. Soaps had a very bad context in the business because uh, you know they were always mocked about you know being a soap actor and stuff like that. I think that technically you could walk away with a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge, but you could also artistically walk away with some bad habits. Um, where, was the, where was the funniest place? I know you guys used to hide lines all over the set. Where, where did you hide your lines, uh, 80 pages of dialogue? I never hid my lines on the set. Oh, I'd have the script. And usually I'd tuck them, you know, in between scenes, you sit there and you read the next scene and go, okay, okay. And you'd tuck them in the sofa. There are times that you'd, You'd go to your set and you'd open up the desk drawer and it'd be filled with everybody else's scripts. Uh, now, I, I knew an actor who used to tear out his lines and he'd put them around during his blocking. And when we'd have notes, I'd walk around and pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> not, it's like, that's if you're not cool. looking at me, you're not listening to me, you're not going to remember your lines. That's my okay. Hillary. So when, when was the first time we worked? Did we work? Well, we worked twice. But yeah. something Wilder first or Driving Miss Daisy? Driving Miss Daisy first. So, Billy, we did a show, which I think is still to this day, the finest 30 minutes or 25 minutes or half an hour of television I ever did. Um, Hillary played Florine. Uh, Bob Guillaume played uh, Daisy. Uh, played played uh, Hoke Coburn and Joan Plowright. Uh, Dame Joan Plowright was wow, best. and uh, what? What? Uh, and Teresa Merritt, who just won a Tony, she was uh, she was in it, and Saul Rubin, uh, Saul Rubin, Saul Rubinick, Saul Rubinick. yeah, Booley, Booley. It, it was terrific. Jessica Tandy played played Daisy in the movie, right? I'm yes. Sorry, Jessica Tandy played Daisy in yeah. the movie. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Fine, fine production too. Billy's in, sorry, pardon Billy's connection. He's in Iceland, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's almost in Iceland for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it was wonderful. And, they, um, and the, uh, the, the producers were the same producers of the film. So, you know, we had the band between scenes playing the music, and we had some of the cars. It was beautiful. We, we tell the story in the book that uh, Alfred Urey wrote the play and won a Pulitzer Prize. He teamed up with Dick Zanuck. They made a movie. They won an Academy Award. Uh, those two teamed up with me and John Wells. We couldn't get the show on the air. That's how difficult a medium television is. 
Well, you remember we shot it the night of the riots. That's correct. And I think that was a, a kibosh because I remember sitting in the audience uh, next to two executives and uh, both of them were like, this is never going to, this is never going to hit the light of day. And I was like, why? It's fabulous. Well, it's just not racially the time to be doing this. I was like, I think it's the perfect time. I, I, I was naive, but I was like, I think this is our history. We have to be able to, we have to be able to talk about our history and show it and be able to look at it, you know, from, with glasses from this day and age, our modern glasses. And uh, so I, I, you know, I, and then when we shot at the night of the riots, it was like, oh boy. But it did air. It, it did, did air. air. It aired on on August, in August of yep. 1992 or something. And the, when it aired, TV Guide gave it nine stars out of ten. Wow. If, so if if it if if it had aired, I would have matched your Emmy. I would have given you a, a, something to shoot for. <laughs> I think that series would still be it, on the air today. It was I that, really do. that good a show. And it's, it's interesting. Really it's interesting that when, when we wrote the chapter about uh, Driving Miss Daisy, uh, that Frank had mentioned that he thought it was the finest hour of television that he ever did. Half hour. It didn't get on the air. But do you think half hour? But, so, but he never mentioned the fact that Watts was going on at the time, and that might have influenced whether or not it made the air. So well, you think that was... It wasn't Watts. It was the, it was the, um, Rodney King, the can't we all get along? Rodney, 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 Rodney King. Rodney King. The Rodney King rise. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the police, the guys had just gotten acquitted and that's what, that's what happened, uh, that night. Um, you know, Southeast Los Angeles just kind of erupted. Just, yeah. Erupted. Exactly. It erupted. So, so from that standpoint, um, you know, it just wasn't a good, wasn't a good time, unfortunately. And also, if we had done it today, uh, they may have been more accepting of it. But you know, everything had a laugh track then, with the exception of Mash. And even Mash had a laugh track, uh, but it was played so low that you almost couldn't hear it. Yeah. You know, the networks insisted on us putting a laugh track in it, and uh, what what we're saying is there were. There were a lot of things that we were saying, which were really, really appropriate to the times of the 50s, but they would put big laughs in it. And I think the laughs killed it because without the laughs, uh, the, today if we made the show without the laughs, it would be sort of like a docudrama or it'd be like a dramedy of sorts and it would be much more accepting. What do you think? I would have allowed to resonate. I think everything that was happening would have been allowed to resonate instead of getting, you know, laugh track because yeah. it was amusing, but it was, um, I mean, just the, just the scene between Joan and I, you know, it just was very subtle. She, she's so subtle. And Robert Guillaume was so subtle. Just I have that one scene where, you know, she's struggling with the pot on the stove and, you know, she won't let him. And then finally she goes, Oh, okay. If you insist and lets him carry the pot cause it's too heavy for her. And no. then it's those wonderful little moments that they just fleshed out. Not to mention Joan Plowright was what a riot. She was a riot. I really? Her. Yes. Yeah. Very funny. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I never would have figured Joan Plowright to be like a, a cut up. Like, you know, I never yeah. would have figured that. Yeah, one of her good friends was Tracy Ullman, and she used to tell me Tracy Ullman stories. Like, I just had dinner with Tracy. And then she told me stories. <laughs> so funny. And Joan Plowright uh, was married to Laurence Olivier. Right. Uh, that was a, another note for Joan. So then we, then we worked on something wilder. I think Derek has a picture of you and Gene somewhere in his, his bag of tricks there. But what was Gene like? For you, oh, he was the kindest, sweetest, most general, gener generous, gentle actor. I, I he taught me so much. Um, he he would talk about um, well. Oh, I see. You're gonna pick it up there, and then you'll cut to this, and you'll do that. And I remember asking him, "How do you know to do that?" He goes, "Oh, you must learn how to do that." He said, "You must." help your editor out. You must understand where your cuts are because that's going to help you as an actor. And I, to this day, that's where my eyes went. Okay. And I started paying attention to that. He was just, 
he was lovely. He was real. Um, and he was very sensitive. And I think that he felt, um, you know, he, he got, I think he got a little bruised by some of the, uh, things that happened, you know, in the, the back room, which I wasn't privy to, but every now and then I, Karen would kind of saddle up going, go sit with Jay. He He loves just to sit with you. So go sit with him. He, he needs a little smile. Well, we had, we had writer problems on Wilder and, uh, uh, you know, I talked about it I, I, in the book, but I told a story in the book about the audience show and Gene, uh, we, we, we did the first show and Gene called me over and he said, Frank, I said, well, yes, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at the audience and he said, what are they doing here? And he said, well, I said, well, the network seems to think uh, they make the show funnier. And he said, gee, I've made some pretty funny movies without the audience. <laughs> I said, <laughs> we got it. Yeah. One of my favorite moments, though, was when um, we were doing the birthday show. And yeah. there were nothing but kids running around, you know, animals and children. You know what they say. <laughs> let, me tell Billy, let me tell Billy what the premise of the show was. The premise of this show was a 55-year-old advertising executive in the Berkshires marries a 30-year-old woman, and they have twins. So the, the, the two twin boys are about the ages of five, and it was a merry mix of, of genes trying to be an older father to the twins. So, and Hillary was the mother. So they, they have this birthday party and whatnot, so they're just nothing but five-year-olds running around or eight year olds that look like five year olds running around. And uh, Jean comes out on the set and we're getting ready to rehearse. And there were a whole bunch of kids and all of a sudden the kids start to run away, you know, except for this one little girl who just stands there and she's looking straight up at Jean. And you know, Jean, he towers one and he looked down and he went, hello. <laughs> and <laughs> he just stared at her and he goes, do you know who I am? And she was like, he said, who am I? She went, we Wonka. That's right. I'm Willy Wonka. That's and funny. she was like, mother came over and got her, but she was just, we Wonka. Oh, it was so cute. That's that's but that's even so then, cute. you know, here he is years, years later, and he just embraced that little girl and, you know, yes, that's who I am. One time when we had, we had a lot of guest stars. We had Marla Maples on and we had, uh, oh God, what's the, the, the rocker, Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper. Wow. Cooper was, they were all <laughs> terrific. And uh, again, Gene sidles over me and he goes, I said, yes, Gene. He says, why do we have these big guest stars on? I'd rather work with the, I'd rather work with uh, Margaret Dumont. What was the woman that was on the show? Oh, uh, um, I'll, I'll come up with it. She yeah. was great. Yeah. He said, I'd rather work with her. And I said, well, Jean, the network likes us to have stunts. And he looked at me and he says, I thought I was the stunt. Again, I thought <laughs> I was the stunt. Was the stunt. <gasps> Except that I must say, Alice Cooper made me laugh. He'd walk on with his cane and he'd do a golf swing and then, yep, shot a 72 today. Yep. Uh, he loved it. He loved being there. Yeah. Really, you know, it was just a really nice, wonderful Jake Weber, who went on to do wonderful things, was so fabulous. And Gregory Ed who played, played the president in. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Bad president. Bad president. Bad. <laughs> what show was that? What? What show was that? He was the bad president for the year. Oh, uh, that was the one with um. Twenty four. Twenty four. Twenty four. Twenty four. Yeah. Twenty four. Yeah. See, um, that takes a little bit longer as we get as we age. We you know what? I can still say lines from One Life to Live, but I can't remember yesterday. That's what. That's the problem. That's <laughs> so it. it Filled with unnecessary stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, I, mean, 
I know you were you were up for Diane English's show. Uh, it came down to you and uh, geez, I, I, Susan Day. Susan Day. Susan Brown? No, not Susan Day. It was it was it was the show that Jay Jay Thomas did after uh, Murphy Brown, and I, I he he played Jack Stein, and. Jay went in to Diane and he said, Diane, please, please cast Hillary. Susan Day is not funny. I, I beg of you, please cast Hillary. And she went with Susan Day. And after the uh, first year of Susan Day on the show, they switched to another actress. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's funny how, how casting can be so subjective sometimes. It was yeah. subjective. You know what? I don't think she trusted herself i don't think she trusted that her script was good enough not to have uh a name like susan day and and that's too bad because her script was really wonderful it was a really wonderful pilot it was one of the better pilots i'd read and it was um, See, what, I, what i'm getting from this conversation between the two of you is, as a layman is basically it's almost like a football team every single thing has to go right or it ain't gonna happen like a fireman you know like we we do everybody has a position if one guy screws up there's so many things that could go wrong that one thing could screw it all up. Yeah, basically, basically. So talking about something that isn't being screwed up, uh, you are doing a new show now called The It Girls on the Stoop. And I want to show, uh, Derek, I want you to show a little bit of it, a, a little clip of, the, of, of a trailer from the preview, but then I want to ask you about how that came about. Okay. okay. Hey everybody, it's Crystal and Hillary, the It Girls on the Stoop. And we want you to go follow us on Facebook and there you can watch all of the extended interviews from all of our fabulous guests. And go check out Porch Chat because we have a lot of fun behind the scenes that uh, you're going to enjoy, I think. As well as tips and anything else, right? Basically a screwing up. Yeah. A lot of behind the scenes. Come check us out. I don't screw up. All right, cut. For God's sake, we can't stay here all day. <laughs> So how did that change? So I, I, I'm going to. Uh, you, you ran out of SAG benefits. So, no matter, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you ran out of SAG benefits and you basically created this show to get health benefits. Is that correct? Well, what had happened was SAG and AFTER merged their health plans and they disenfranchised everyone over 55 who had taken early retirement and been guaranteed um, their health care for the rest of their life. So uh, after being two years of retired, I, they told us in July and we had to make X number of thousands of dollars by um, the, the, we had 15 weeks, 13 weeks in which to do it. And it was hiatus. So they really left us high and dry. And uh, so we had to go to the marketplace and find healthcare and, and in that time, uh, Crystal and I said, "What? What are we doing? What, we, we have to create our own own stuff. No one wants someone who's been who's was over fifty five, and, and you know, they're not looking for me." So um, we had done this movie in Venice, the series. We did a scene, the two of us in the kitchen, where I was teaching her how to cook, and basically we ended up getting drunk and passing out. But we did create some. <laughs> and the fans, the fans loved it. They just loved that scene, and they wanted to do a cooking show. And then the next year, we produced a movie called One Million Happy Nows. Um, beautiful movie, and uh, because we we're also both in it, we would do production meetings at night after everyone left. We'd cut, and then we'd go and make a cocktail and go sit on the stoop outside the house we were shooting in and we ended up talking like you know a couple of it girls on the stoop doing things stupid simple not to be confused with stupid girls you know we went on and on and on 
And so I said, why don't we do It Girls on the Stoop and just do a cooking show? And she said, yeah, okay. So we got one person, um, Adriana Torres, who is brilliant. And she was, she did all our cameras and our sound and edited. And it was just Crystal and myself and Adriana. And we would cook and laugh. Well, the first season, that was the trailer for the second season. The first season, we did, the fans sent us shots that they wanted us to do. So we'd start every show out with a shot. And we'd end every show with a cocktail and our dinner. And we'd do three shows a day. <laughs> so it was really fun. And uh, the first show we aired was actually the last show we shot. And uh, we were so punchy, I, I ended up wetting my pants on camera. <laughs> so if you go to Vimeo and just do It Girls on the Stoop season one, you'll see the first uh, episode where uh, we end up in hazmat suits with our clothes, putting them in the washing machine. And, uh, <laughs> and the fans loved it. At season two, we did things a little tamer. We did things a little slower. We did yoga. And now season three, we have to do Zoom. Uh, so we're trying this new thing, which is putting our, our Zoom and we're, we're, we're taping our own press and, uh, and, getting guests to tape their prep, and then we're putting it all together. And we'll see how it goes. Who knows? That's, that's you know, same thing Billy and I are doing. We're used to, we're used to being in, in, in the studio in Pasadena, with really my garage, but we used to be in the studio and Derek's joining us, but we have to do Zoom now because we're just, or Skype, because uh, everybody's got babies and grandbabies and because of the COVID. We're back in, 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 uh, in production because, you know, SAG AFTRA health plan has yet again changed things and has disenfranchised a whole bunch of people, including people who are over 65, their residuals no longer count towards their health care and stuff. So that's why we decided we got to go back into production. We got to, you know. So, uh, hello. so you, I, I have a question. Okay, Derek. Sorry. I just want to put Frank on the spot a, a, a bit. So you have a production. So you have a team of people that uh, you work with for your. <laughs> no. He, yes. just, His he, name one, is... he just said she has one person who does everything. Oh, really? <laughs> and they make money. I want to ask how they make money because, Derek, we're not making a dime. <laughs> how, did he, how did he monetize you, huh? Um, well, we, we monetize it by raising the money and we do that, um, you know, on various social platforms of, uh, Indiegogo, things like that. we raise the money. We also sell perks. Um, you, you can have dinner with me for, you know, $4,000, uh, oh, you know, we do things like that. Phone calls, we'll do, um, uh, sign things. We sell memorabilia. We sell uh, we have a store, so we have aprons that we sign and sell. I mean, so we, we, we monetize it as best we can to raise the money to, to make the production. We're not really, we're not stuffing our coffers. We're just trying to make the production and put it out there. To make your nut. Yeah. Make your nut. Make and let, nut. let me explain. Because no matter how long Hillary worked or no matter how long I worked, uh, eventually our union benefits are going to expire. So mine expired. Fortunately, I qualify for Medicare. So even though I'm working now, uh, I can't, uh, I'll just get Medicare. But my, for, for years, for 35 years, I collected DGA uh, benefits as a director. Uh, for yeah. years, Hillary co uh, directed, I mean, collected SAG after and uh, after benefits. Uh, of course, those plans are great when you're in it. But I believe that, you know, if there's 100,000 people in SEG, like 15% of them qualify for benefits. Right. Before, Hillary was always, you know, first in the 15%. Now that she's on the outside, she's got to scrap yeah, Get a scrap around and, and do what you can. I'm still on SEG. My husband and I are still, you know, on it. It's, it's, a, it's a really good policy. Um, I, I kept saying, why can't you just up the up the you know, the ante, make it a little bit more expensive. I, I'd pay for it. 
I pay more for it just to not have to um, go to the open market and to keep the consistency. But we've had to change, you know, you had to change doctors, you had to do all of that. Um, so, you know, once then it used to be once you went on Medicare, the supplemental, all your supplemental was covered and they just changed that too. So it's, it's, it's unfortunate. That's wild. Yeah. I think there's a big lawsuit, a class action suit too. Well, I'm still fortunate. I'm still on DGA supplemental. So at least for a year or two, I got some credits for that. Good. Good. Next for you. Gosh, you know, I have, my golf game's getting pretty good at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying, um, and, and I'm about to be a grandmother. Yes, I heard that. Oh, wonderful. Thank wonderful. you. I had so much to do with it. And now it's, I'm really looking forward to it. I really am. Uh, as a matter of fact, due date is three weeks from this day. And um, and it's going to be another Roman numeral. So um, we're, we're a little boy. Yeah, they, 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 these wasps name everybody after the same person. So this will be a... <laughs> so how are you? Are you, no, are you no. living in a key? Are you living in a keys now? I am. Yes. What, what key are you living in? Key Largo. Oh, are you in Key Largo? Yeah. yeah. I was at Homestead for about a year or two, and I used to keep oh. my boat in Key Largo. Oh, did you really? Yeah, I used to boat. I used to keep my boat in a, in a yard. I don't remember the name of the yard in Key Largo, but uh, then I read it. What actually happened was when I first retired from the fire department. My, I, I sold the restaurant. I had a restaurant and bar, and I sold it. And I told my girlfriend, I said, let's get as far away from New York as possible. So we went down to Key West. And she was a teacher, so she started teaching English at Key West. So I said, just, this is beautiful. Get us an apartment. So she comes back, and I found this beautiful apartment. She said, beautiful apartment. Price is right. I said, what key is it in? She said, Ramrod Key. <laughs> I said, forget about it. <laughs> There's no way I'm telling the guys in the firehouse to retire it and move the ramrod thing. I said, no matter what. I said, forget about the house, forget about everything. <laughs> so we ended up living in Key Largo. But I love the keys. Which yeah, I absolutely it's love it. It's beautiful. Yeah. The voters, yeah. It's really uh, it's just quiet and it's active and um you're outside all the time i'm just not a cold person who likes the cold i never have it is so. really, <laughs> it is really <laughs> oh i hear you i hear you i go back to pick, california there, I there, can you show me the pic show hillary again the picture of where billy lives yes he lives in california an hour and a half. hillary an hour and a half from la but i'm seven thousand feet up Billy's in the house. mountains and this is where oh. i woke up to this morning <laughs> where are you you're <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not narrow, he asked you where you are in Arrowhead, but no, he's in a place called Pine Mountain Village. Pine Mountain Club. Yeah, it's about uh, it's about seven thousand feet up. It's a beautiful spot in the summer, but uh, if it wasn't for the COVID, I'd be in Florida right now. I'd be in the Keys right now. I love Key West. I love the Keys. I love the food. I love the fish sandwiches. The the weather. The everything about yeah, the Keys. It's the best. Well, right now, this has been one of the most beautiful winters. It, it, it's not windy. It's 75 out during the day. It goes down to the uh, high 50s at night, which is great. We sleep with everything wide open. It's it's just beautiful. It's just been a great. You know what's funny? You know what's great about the Keys? And, and this, Frank, you'll love this. When I, naturally, I was drinking when I was in the Keys. It was one of the reasons I got out of the Keys. Because, it's, you know, if you get out of Key West, it's all burnt out guys from the 60s. I mean, that's it. They're all roaming around there. Everybody's drinking. Everybody's wired up. I mean, and there's nothing to do but fish or drink. I mean, that's what they do in the Keys. But every bar you walk into, I swear to God, nobody's watching football games. Nobody's watching the news. All they got on is people in the north shoveling snow. <laughs> it's like every bar you walk into, you see a picture of a guy digging out a 14 foot of snow in Minnesota. That's right. know, and then when you when you go to order breakfast, and of course you're from New York, everything's hot, hot, pop, pop. And you go to the breakfast place in the Keys, you say, let me have two eggs over easy, blah, blah, blah. Well, 15, 20 minutes later, you say, excuse me, waitress, uh, where's my order? She goes, welcome to the Keys. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Nobody's in a hurry. Get over yourself. That's it's right. Great place to live. Yeah. Great place to live. 
It's nice. It's just really nice. So it's interesting. Key West is a little different now because the cruise ships are coming in. And when the cruise ships came in, you know, the people would, uh, uh, they, 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 it, the, the town was getting a little trashed. So they'd come to drink, but they wouldn't eat. They'd go back to the boat to eat, and then they'd come back out to party. So they now have wow. a curfew, and they shut everything down. They promote really? all day long, and then they send them back to the boat, and they'll be open for dinner, and then it, the town shuts down about 11 o'clock. That's it. Done. Go home. Wow, it's so yeah. different. Yeah, I mean, to me, the Val Street and Key West, was sort of like Bourbon Street in New Orleans. The only right. difference is in New Orleans, there's nothing else to do but drink. At least at two o'clock in the morning in Key West, they'd say, uh, oh, I'm going fishing in the morning. I got to get up. I'm going scuba diving. I'm doing this. But in New Orleans, there's no shutting down. There's nothing yeah. to do in that town but drink. It's a 24 hour drinking town. But uh, that's wonderful that you're out there. I, I, I envy you, especially now. You saw my outdoors. I can't I believe I really it. envy you. I don't be shoveling that stuff. It's dangerous. How long have you been there? <laughs> um, we bought down here in like, gosh, um, I guess late nineties, and um, you know, we just kind of we rented out and we just kind of sneaked down for a week or so, or a couple, you know, a couple of days, whatever. And about three years ago, I finally went. Well, I can work from anywhere. I don't need to be in New York. And not only that, but you weren't going into casting director's office. You were putting yourself on tape. So that so about five years ago, I started coming down here more. And then three years, three or four years ago, I, I became a Florida resident. That's good yeah. for you. Good for you. And you bought it at 1990 prices. Yeah. And I what? And you bought it at 1990 prices. Yes. Yes. Real yeah. estate. So that's that's increase in value terrifically well that's yeah, and, and and i have to tell you just in the last year it's gone through the roof because with covid i mean you it's amazing the people that have come down to the keys because monroe county uh bill you'll probably remember right south of homestead it goes right into Mo monroe county and they right. shut down they put up a roadblock when covid hit last spring and wow. you could not get in unless you were a resident of monroe county and they shut the hotels down, and they shut the restaurants down, and that was it. You could not get in unless you were a resident. Well, well, Hillary, I can definitely understand that because you're off the mainland, and everybody you know wants to get isolated. And it's the same thing all over the country. Like even in Pine Mountain Club, where I am, I mean, I'm in the middle of a national forest, but I see people from LA up here all the time riding around looking for places because yeah. of COVID. They're trying yeah. to get out of LA. Same thing in New York. People upstate New York. Uh, they're making people that own farms are multi-millionaires now because the land everybody's getting out of Manhattan. Yeah, and there were places in Maine that were sold sight unseen. They just want it out. Building is through the roof. You can't even get you can't even get to appliances if you're building a new house. You you know you you're you know twelve weeks, fourteen weeks wow. down the COVID distribution chain. Yeah, it's just they can't. But they they're can't building that much. Through. They're building that much in the Keys, even with the limited space? Um, the Keys, not so much, but in Maine, they are. The Keys, oh, actually, Maine. Okay. I take that back. They are building. What they did was, after Irma, Hurricane Irma, and I may be mistaken, but my understanding is you were no longer allowed to have a mo mobile home. It had to have a motor in it so that when you were told to evacuate, you started your home and you drove it away. Um, because the, the mobile homes were just washed across the keys and then it ended up in the bay. So yeah. they, yeah, they said no more of those. So, um, so yeah, people were looking for a little bit more permanent structures and also up stilted, you know, so water. Well, when, I, when I was living in the keys, uh, it was probably 11 years or 12 years after Andrew and people were still talking about Andrew cause I was in Homestead. And Andrew hit Homestead like, oh yeah, ninety three. Uh, yeah, crazy, crazy. Yeah. I mean, they were still talking about it ten years later. They're still talking about it now. Andrew was, yeah. you know, went down. And Irma was bad. Had Irma not jogged to the west the night before, it would have been another Andrew for us. Because we were. Well, I heard if Andrew's twenty miles north and it would have hit Miami, it would have did more damage money wise than any hurricane we ever had, and that includes the Katrina. 
Yeah. So that's crazy, dog. It's crazy. Yeah. So, it's you can always evacuate. You want to get the hell out of there. That's right. So, Hill, I would be remiss before we before we signed off if I didn't send you regards from Barry Halley. I just got Barry Halley's Christmas card, which made me laugh <laughs> because his hat, glasses, mask. <laughs> you don't even know who it is. <laughs> I didn't even get one. Barry Halley's a gal that was an associate producer on, uh, one of the producers on Something Wilder, who I'm working with now at Warner Brothers. We're working together. We're really almost COVID police uh, on, uh, on stages, but we work out of our house, so it's a pretty good gig. So that was the big thing, was that Frank and Barry and I felt like we were the three musketeers. I have a picture still of you sandwiched between Barry and I. The, I think it was the last night. Uh, of production. We were so sad because we really loved that crew and that cast. It was so much fun. Anyway, Barry and I looked very similar yeah. to each other. And yeah, uh, yeah. so we always were. And, just, oh, all and good I, I was the meat of that sandwich. You were the meat of that sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the motion and you had it, baby. Yeah. The Earl, oh. the Earl of Sandwich. The Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> I was the Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for coming on. Oh, I'm so glad to meet you, Billy, and you too, oh, Derek. Pleasure. I know you're the pleasure. you're the brains behind the operation. Well, yeah, <laughs> must be talking Derek, about. Derek's the brains behind the operation, but the truth is, the, the operation couldn't function without each of the three of us. We each bring something unique to the table, and today I was fortunate enough to bring Hillary Bailey Smith. So, oh, well, Frank, so Frank, she gave us a great idea. We can start selling dinners with me for a warm can of beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. You start monetizing. You know, I mean, they got the books there, but why don't you get a, you know, some aprons, some hats with your logo on it, and you know, pull up that oh, here we cup go. right here we there. Go. Is. There we go. <laughs> See, now you need to start selling them. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll we'll make as much money on that as we're making on the book. I just don't think people are gonna people are gonna want to have dinner with me like they want to have dinner with you, Hillary. You're absolutely charming. You're Great awesome. Awesome. Oh. Thanks, Hill. Well, I like the name of your show, a Mick, a Mook, and a Mike. I think was, that's great. It was supposed to be <laughs> it was supposed to be Mooks and a Mike, but believe it or not, that was taken. I was satisfied. I was happy with two Mooks and a Mike because. That, <laughs> when, when Billy's wife Jennifer came up with a Mick, a Mook, and a Mike. That left me with me in the mood. <laughs> you know. can always be a Mick, but in your persuasion, ethically, you might think that's worse. I don't know. Yeah, that would be worse. <laughs> All right, my dear. Do well. Give my love to Nip. Uh, I certainly will. My love to Karen. You and bet. to Karen and your grandbaby. Yes, you betcha. We'll do that for sure. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Thank Absolutely. you, Hillary. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So, Derek, pretty good guest, huh? Great. Uh, great. Pretty good oh, she was terrific. She's real affable. Like you said, she's a dame. She's like, you know, in the old days, when we used to call a woman abroad, it was a, it was a compliment. Like, you know, Liz Taylor was known as the a fine old broad, you know, fine broad. You know, and that was a compliment. Right. Now yeah. you can't. Yeah, that Hil Hillary was a broad, a dame. She fit the description of, you know, like Margaret Dumont. She was just, Margaret Dumont was Groucho Marx foil in all of the Marx Brothers movie. She played the staid old, you know, patrician woman, uh, but she was hilarious. And Hillary was- Oh, hilarious. yeah. Hillary the first line that comes to mind with Margaret Dumont is when she's hugging Groucho, and she says, hold me closer, closer, closer. And Groucho says, if I was any closer, I'd be behind you. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. so billy so now what do we got a super bowl coming up so, yeah we do the big game the big game uh so I, I'm, city I'm, Tampa. I don't know. I'm sure you've been pouring over the charts all week <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm gonna take the sure bet and go against you because i'm i think i'm 11 and 4 or 12 the guru the I, guru and the guru, uh, you are the not so guru. So, who do you like this week, and why do you like them? 
Well, you know me, I'm a dog better. I always bet the dogs, but uh, I think this Kansas City team is too much. I think uh, I think the, the quarterback. I think the kid's too much. I think he's uh, he's the real deal, and I, I don't think Brady's mobile. So I'm going to go with the chalk. I'm going to lay the three points to take Kansas City. And in some venues, Frank, I've seen some guys out there with three and a half already. So uh, if you can get the three, I, I would lay the three. But the three and a half could make a big difference. I mean, Brady and three and a half is, is tough. What do you like? Well, I, I sort of like Kansas City. But I'm going to bet on Tampa Bay because you pick it Kansas City. <laughs> I couldn't pick my nose is what you're trying to tell me. Going with the odds on this one, and the odds are you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's way, a pretty good bet. By the way, hang on a second. That's a pretty good bet he's got there, Derek. I couldn't pick a one-horse race. I couldn't pick a winner in a one-horse race. I hope you're right because Look at that. This, hey! this is the cover of our next book. I, I don't think you can see it. but it's Bring it down, it, down. Hang on a second. I'm going to move the chair. Okay. Yeah. That's it's called the Mars Gamble. The Mars Gamble. The story of the AFL-NFL merger. It's got all sorts of cloak and dagger stuff to it. Um, it's a, a, a fine book, and it's about uh, L Lamar is Lamar Hunt, who founded the AFL, uh, which became the NFL. And, and it's full, uh, full of anecdotes about the merger and about the, why the teams became known as the teams they are, uh, why are the Kansas City Chiefs the Chiefs, why are the Jets the Jets. Uh, yeah. And it'll be out. It'll be out this summer. It'll be out in, in time for next season. So we have a rooting interest in Kansas City. Kansas City. Kansas City. That's for sure. That's Without for sure. a doubt, it's the whole history of the Kansas City Chiefs. And if we had to put a subtitle on it. I would call it Nothing's on the Level. Nothing. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> so it's an interesting book. You guys yes. bought, you guys bought a you guys, pretty proud of it. You guys bought a spot, an advertising spot for the book. On the uh, Super Bowl, right? Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, yeah. yeah. We got an hour. We took a full hour of it. Okay. <laughs> 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 so that's now that the money's pouring, pouring in into a trickle, we, we took a whole hour of it. Yeah, yes, yeah. Sir. The book will be out in June in time for next football season. But it's, yeah. already, it's already done. It's being printed. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a lot of you guys read it. But in the in the interim, if these lips could talk, there they are. There they are. I love it, guys. So prolific. That's amazing. And yeah. then there's a chapter about something Wilder, which Hillary, uh, Hillary and you were talking about. There's a whole chapter about Gene Wilder in there that's yeah. uh, illuminating and yeah. funny. Illuminating! Wow, we're working, illuminating. We're working on our vocabulary again, huh? Maybe I'm worth maybe I'm worth two cans of cork, a warm beer. You know what I mean? Have dinner with me. <laughs> well, uh, yours. We'll, we'll, we'll offer off the person can drink yours as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, next week you'll try to get me. I'll be in Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> One drink and I end up in Tibet. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't want that. Anyway, uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, next week, our guest is the inimitable Charlie Steiner. Charlie Steiner. ESPN and the Los Angeles Diners, voice of the Los Angeles Diners. So he, he'll be a great guest. So, so long, everybody. Thanks for joining. Yeah. And enjoy the Super Bowl. And yeah, and subscribe on YouTube or Facebook and watch at your leisure. A mick, a mook, and a mic. And thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate the support. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next week.